Well, good evening. How is everybody tonight? I'm so glad to be here with you. I'm normally back in the kids' area. So if you get a little rowdy tonight, it's okay. Believe me, you won't bother me at all. <laughs> Let me just say this uh, on behalf of my team in children's ministry. I want to thank you, parents, for allowing us to minister to your kids every single service. Um, we know that your kids are the single most precious gift that you could give to the world. And so when you hand them to us on every service, I want you to know that we don't take that lightly, that we understand that this is your gift to us. And so we're doing our very best to put the word of God in them and, and to be sure that they're, they're safe and that everything they do uh, will infuse them with the word of God. So um, on behalf of my team, I just want to say thank you very much for allowing us to do that every service. If you would tonight, turn with me to uh, Judges chapter 6. Uh, you know, guys, uh, being in children's ministry, I've been doing it a little over 20 years. And uh, it's funny the perspective that, that kids have on things. Um, it's funny that, you know, people say, well, kids say the, the funniest things. Um, one time I was doing a, like a four and five year old class. It was about Christmas time. And so we, uh, we were drawing pictures for our parents for Christmas. And so I was walking around talking to all the four and five year olds about their, uh, about their, you know, the picture that they were drawing. And I came upon this little girl, and she had drawn an airplane. And so I said, um, what's this? You know, you never try and assume anything because you're always wrong with four- and five-year-olds. So just, just ask them. So I said, what's this? And she said, oh, this is my airplane. And I said, that's cool. I said, um, you got different people in the, in the, in the pictures. Uh, who, who's in this window? She said, well, that's Mary, and, you know, and that's Joseph, and, and there's some other disciples, and there's some wise men. I said, that's cool. I said, well, who's, who's, who's in the front? She said, oh, that's Pontius the pilot. Duh. So, you know, kids' perspective on things is just, it, it, it can be funny at times, but a lot of times their perspective is the way it is because they haven't had the challenges in life we've had. They haven't seen some of the things we've seen, and so um, when they look at something, they're looking at it through very innocent eyes. They're looking at it very, through, very, through eyes of inexperience. And um, tonight I want to talk to you about God is a forward thinker. So many times in life we find ourselves stuck because as adults, we're looking through adult eyes with adult issues. And instead of being like kids and just taking God at his word, we're not, we, we stop where we are. We don't continue to go on. And so God is always thinking forward. And here in Judges chapter 6, we're going to talk about a man named Gideon, but Here's, let me kind of set this picture for you. There was a lady named Deborah who was the judge of Israel. And uh, for 40 years, she was the judge and they had peace and prosperity. And then when she died, Israel turned away from God again to other idols. And, uh, and, and then because they did, God handed the Israelites back over to the Midianites. And the Midianites um, were, were the kind of people that didn't just oppress Israel all the time. What they did is they, they found places to hide in caves and in mountains and they would wait and they would watch. And so they let the Israelites grow their, their crops and, and watch their sheep herds grow. And just as they were about to harvest, they'd go in, kill the Israelites, and take their crop. And so not only were they oppressing the Israelites, but they were taking everything they owned. They were taking all their food, anything that they had just grown was all being taken from them. And so here we find this man named Gideon in chapter 6. We're going to start in, in verse 11. And it says this, Gideon, son of Joash was in the threshing wheat in the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has this happened to us? And where are all the miracles that our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest of the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least of my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting one man. It's funny to me how God didn't come to Gideon in this pit, and he's grinding a little bit of wheat down on the bottom at night trying to be as quiet as he can so that way the Midianites don't hear that he's grinding this wheat, come and kill him and take what little he has. And he's hiding in this pit and he's trying to get just a little bit of grain for his family and God appears to him 
and doesn't say, huh, this is a fine mess you're in. This is really great. You, you did this, and, and I can't believe you're here. No, God says, oh, mighty man of valor. Why? Because God is a forward thinker. God isn't going to talk to you about where you are right now. God wants to talk to you about where you're going. God doesn't want to leave you where you are right now. And he knows if he talks to you about where you are right now, you might stay. But if he begins to talk to you about where you're going, he can help you to get up and move on. So he says to Gideon, O mighty man of valor, because that's the way God saw Gideon. You understand, we, we say all the time that God is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. But what that name really means is the God that sees in advance and provides. What does that mean? God's already there. And he's already made a way for you to get there. He's the God that sees in advance. He's the God that's already there. And so when he talks to you, he doesn't talk to you about where you are. He talks about where you're going. Because he realizes to get you to move, I can't leave you where you are. I've got, I've got to paint a picture for you for the future. So then God says to Gideon, Gideon says, um, Sir, Gideon replying, if the Lord is with us, why has this happened to us? And where are the miracles our ancestors told us about? Did they not say the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Gideon begins to remind God of his situation. Okay, if you're not going to acknowledge this terrible place that I'm at, if you're not going to acknowledge that I'm in this pit trying to grind this little bit of grain, let me explain to you my situation. You come to me and say, Almighty oh, man of valor, and yet, where am I? So let me tell you, God, where I am. How many times do we do that? God says, listen, this is where you're going. And we go, okay, let me tell you where I am. And God says, okay, let me tell you where you're going. And Gideon's no different. Gideon just says, hey, this is where I am. And God said, listen, I don't care how you've fallen. I don't care where you are. I just care about where you're going. Doesn't matter how you got where you are. All I care about is where you're headed. And I can't talk to you about where you are because you'll stay here. It's comfortable. I need you to move on. I need you to go on. I need you to press on. So, almighty man of valor, come on. Let's go. It's funny to me the conversation that God has with him. Because in looking at the story, it's almost like God just takes a breath, lets Gideon talk, and then he finishes a sentence. Gideon reminds God of where he is, and then God says, Then the Lord turned to him and said, I will be with you. And will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting just one man. God doesn't even, doesn't even acknowledge his question. Gideon says, okay, where have you been? I mean, the, our ancestors said you, you took us out of Egypt. You did all these miracles and now I'm here. God doesn't even say, okay, I'm sorry. I went away for a while. It's been a little bit. God just says, listen. I'm with you, now get out of here and go, go strike the Midianites. He doesn't even acknowledge that Gideon's trying to tell him, I'm in this terrible situation. He doesn't even acknowledge it. He just says, he doesn't even say, okay. Doesn't even, doesn't even acknowledge it. It's like he just paused for a minute and was like, are you done? Okay, now go strike the Midianites. Good, all right, great. Now go strike the Midianites. Doesn't even acknowledge what Gideon said. He just finished his own sentence. Said, okay, here we go. Gideon, God doesn't care about where you've been. He only cares about where you're going because God is a forward-thinking God. Shove three people and say, God is a forward-thinking God. Go ahead, shove three people. Got to shove them. You know, shove, you know, shove, shove three people. Say, come on, shove three people. Say, God is a forward-thinking God. God is a forward-thinking God. There was, um, there was several years ago, about seven to be exact, that um, I felt like I was on top of the world. I felt like I had the world by the tail, and I was going after it. I was, I was a children's minister. In fact, I was the children's minister here. We were running about 600 kids on an average weekend, had the Victory Kids mobile truck out two nights a week, had a truck full of food. We were feeding kids in the park. We, we had all kinds of stuff going on, great VBSs. It was awesome. And I felt like, man, I'm at the top of my game. I got this. My goodness, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to take Amarillo. And then I found out that my wife was going on the Internet and doing some things that a married woman shouldn't do. And so um, when things wouldn't change and, and things wouldn't progress differently, 
Um, Pastor David reached out to us and tried to help us. He was patient. He was kind. I mean, he, he probably did more than, than, any, than any pastor should have done for us. And when she wouldn't change, because you're not going to change if you don't want help. Uh, I met with him, and we decided that, that I needed to step away from ministry to kind of take care of my family. Because if you don't have a family, you don't have a ministry. So I stepped away to take care of my family. And four months after uh, being out of ministry, um, going back into heating and air, uh, she decided that the men on the internet were more important than my two sons and I, and she left us. Then two months after that, I found out that my finances were not near in the shape that I thought they were. I was fixing to lose my house, fixing to lose my, my one son was 16. I was fixing to lose his car. And so I had to file for bankruptcy to save what little I had. And then a month after that, my divorce was final. So in less than a year, I went from being on the top of my game to having nothing. I, 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 and everything that I felt I had worked so hard for, everything that I felt like God and I had built together, was gone. It was gone. And so one night, I was crying out to God, probably whining pretty good about my situation. You know, it's not fair. Here I was serving you. Here I was doing what you said. Here I was giving everything I had, and that's all gone. It's, I mean, it's gone. What was the point? And God took me to Isaiah 54, 11. And Isaiah 54, 11 says this. I thought God that night was going to say, okay, Nathan, I understand and pat me and love me and, and hug me and cuddle me and say, it's going to be okay. But instead what he said was, oh, storm-battered city, troubled and desolate, I will rebuild you with jewels and I will make your foundations from Lapis and Lowsley. See, God didn't talk to me about where I was. He didn't talk to me about what I had been through. He didn't talk to me about, oh, it's going to be okay. He just said, listen, I'm going to rebuild you right now. Right now, it starts right now. Right now, I start rebuilding you. Right now. Will you fast forward two years? And uh, when I first started here at Victory, uh, uh, Lynn, my wife, was uh, the nursery director at the time. You know how it is that in, in two years you kind of lose contact. And we were friends, but, you know, we just didn't talk much. And through a series of events, we, we reconnected and, and then started dating. And then we got married. And she, uh, she loves my children. She loves my boys. She took them in as her own. You know how it is taking two teenage boys in. Uh, and she just loved them right on through it all. And then you fast forward another five years. And here I stand with you tonight. You see, God's a forward thinker. God, God always sees, for he's Jehovah Jireh. He already saw seven years down the road. He already knew. But, it, but if he would have just patted me and said, Nathan, it's going to be okay, I may have stayed where I was. I may, may, I may have stayed in the woe is me because it gets comfortable. But instead he said, no, 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 I start rebuilding you tonight. Tonight. I start rebuilding you. Tonight. The other point that I want to bring up is if you go to um, Ephesians and you look in chapter 6, you look at the armor of God, it says this in, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14, it says, Stand your ground, putting on your belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness, your, for shoes put on the peace that comes from good, the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil and put on salvation as your helmet and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If you'll notice, God didn't talk about the, 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 the neck plate. He didn't talk about the back plate. All he talked about was your breastplate, your shield, your sword, your shoes, your helmet. Every body armor of the, of, the, uh, of the Christian faith is always forward. God never talked about your backside because he never expected you to get in battle and turn around and go the other way. God always expected you to go forward. He never said anything about having the neck plate on or the back plate on. Why? You don't need them. God never expected you to get into a battle, have trouble and go, okay, I'm going to go this way. You don't need your back because he never expected you to go forward. 
He never expected you to stop going forward. He never expected you to stop going forward. Because it's not how you fall, it's how you get up. It's not where you fall, it's how you get up. God is a forward-thinking God, and he says, listen, I don't care how you fall. I don't care what pitch you're in. It doesn't matter. It's how you're going to get up. What are you going to do now? Where are you going now? I don't care where you've been. I want to know where we're going now. God is a forward-thinking God, and he expects us to think forward with him. If you will, go back to Judges with me. We're going to continue this little story with Gideon. So Gideon decides, okay, well, I've told you my situation, and you're still talking to me about something I don't understand, because you're talking about the future and telling me how I'm going to beat the Midianites and, and I'm in this pit. Let me tell you who I am. In verse, three, in verse 15, Gideon says, But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest of all the tribe in Manasseh, and I am the least of my entire family. You understand that people don't come to this kind of a conclusion just on their own. You know, I met many kids that, that are poor, but they don't know they're poor. Why? They've never been told it. They've never been told, oh, you're poor. I've never met a kid that thought he was dumb unless he's been told, you're dumb. Why? He doesn't know it. Obviously, Gideon had been told, well, Manasseh's like the weakest clan of all the clans, and, you know, you're like the run of the litter. You're like the smallest, right? So Gideon has now taken on what other people have told him. Gideon is now saying, okay, God, you see my situation. You know I'm not going to acknowledge my situation. Let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you who I am. And, guys, what you have to understand is God needs you to think forward. God can't leave you where you are. Here's the other thing. God, you may have done what people say you did, but you are not who they say you are. You may have done what people say you did, but you are not who they say you are. You know, guys, my dad, I'm, I'm from, originally from Missouri, about an hour west of St. Louis. The town I grew up in now has 600 people. Big town. So my dad, before he became a Christian, was a moonshiner. So I could tell people I'm a moonshiner son, but I'm not. My dad's a preacher. No, I'm a preacher's son. You understand? You label yourself. You can be your own worst enemy because you are the only person stopping you. God says, I'm Jehovah Jireh. I'm your provider. I'm a forward thinker. And all you got to do is think forward with him. You have to continue. You have to continually say, listen, I'm not going to believe what people say about me. I'm not who they say I am. I may have done what they said I did. Okay, maybe I stole. Okay, maybe I did drugs. Okay, maybe, maybe I was an alcohol, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm a good dad. I'm a great father. I'm a great husband. You cannot believe what other people say about you. You have to believe what God says about you. You have to be a forward thinker with God. So God says to Gideon, one more time, Gideon, and he says to Gideon, he says, if you truly are helping me, oh, I'm sorry. The Lord said to him, I will show you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. God, again, doesn't even acknowledge what he said. God doesn't say, okay, I know you're the weakest of the weak, but I'm going to strengthen you. He doesn't even say that. He says, listen, just go. I'm with you. And when you fight them, it's going to be like one man. When you fight them, it's going to be like you're just fighting one person. It's going to be like, you're just fighting one individual. There may be hundreds of them, but I'm with you. Do you understand? I'm with you. It doesn't matter what people say about you. It doesn't matter what they say you did. It doesn't matter where they say you come from. It doesn't matter. I'm with you. And if I'm with you, there's nothing you can't do. So get up and go. And Gideon, of course, if you read the rest of the story, he's still so timid that he says, okay, well, God, if it's really you, then, then let's do this fleece deal. Well, God, if it's really you, right? Because he doesn't trust himself. Guys, you have to be a forward thinker. You have to think forward with God. Because God is a forward thinker. God's always seeing down the road. Even if life is great for you, even if everything's going awesome, God's still got somewhere for you to go. 
God's still got something for you to do. God's still got people who need you. And there's some place you have to go. You can't stay where you are because God is a forward thinker. When Lynn and I uh, first got married, uh, I had had a, an offer from a couple different churches to be the children's minister at the churches. And, um, and I turned them down. And so she came to me and she said, you know, wh- why, did you, why did you turn this down? And I said, well, you know, I just, I just don't think it's the timing. We, we're, we're just getting married and I just think it's timing. And my wife looked at me and, and gently patted me and said, okay, you, you stick with that story for now. When you're ready to tell me, you can tell me. She's real good at doing that to me. And, um, and so I said, okay. So a couple weeks later, another church called and said, hey, you know, we have a children's ministry position. We want to know if you'll take it. And uh, I said, no, no, I, don't, I just don't think it's the time. And she, she said, okay, really, really, really tell me what, what's going on with you. And I said, well, you know, honey, I know that the Bible says that the calling of God is without repentance. So I know God has still called me in the children's ministry. She said, yeah. I said, I know God's big, and so God can do anything. So I, I know this isn't too big for God. She said, yeah. I said, but after all that I've done, why would he want to use me? I mean, I embarrassed my pastor. I embarrassed my family. I embarrassed him. Why? Why would he want to put me there again? Why would he use me? Why? And she said, you know, Nathan, here's what I think. She said, I think you've forgiven everybody in this situation but you. And I thought about that for a minute, and don't tell her this, but she was right. (laughs) And I said, uh, so I went, and I told the Lord, and, and I forgave myself, and I said, okay, Nathan, I forgive you for embarrassing God. I forgive you for embarrassing your pastor. I forgive you for embarrassing your family. And then I did something. Sometimes you got to do something a little crazy. I went to my bathroom. I shut the door so my family couldn't hear me because sometimes you got to hide your crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and I looked in the mirror, and I said, Nathan, I believe in you. Nathan, you're a great children's minister. I like the way you serve people. I, I like the way you love kids. I like the way you preach. I, I like the fact that, that you love kids. You love to see kids grow. And I bawled like a baby. I didn't believe a word of it. So the next day I went in the bathroom and I shut the door. I looked in the mirror and I said, Nathan, I believe in you. I believe you're a good man. I believe you're a good children's minister. I believe God's got good things for you. And I did that day after day after day. And about three months later, another church approached me and and asked if I would be the children's minister there part-time. I could stay in heating and air and do it. And they asked if, if Lynn and I would come and, and build a children's ministry for them. They didn't have a children's ministry in place, didn't have the facilities for it, didn't have teachers or anything. And so I saw it as an opportunity that God was giving me to go ahead and step back in. And so Lynn and I did that as a good church here in town, and we helped rebuild the children's ministry there and put classrooms in place and trained teachers and built it up. And after, um, after about two years, God, um, God led us to... To, to leave that church. God said, you know, your time's done here. And the pastor said, you know, my job was to build this. We built it. You got great leaders in place. Everything's good. God's just telling us it's time to go. You're a great church. And so we, we, we left there and came here and God opened the doors for us to be the children's ministers here again. And so we're back here again helping Pastor David build something great in Amarillo. But when I close my eyes, I see a stadium full of children. See, See, it doesn't stop here. See, God's a forward thinker. It can't stop here. If it stopped here, it couldn't help other kids. It couldn't reach out any farther. If it stopped here, this is it. This is great. But it can't stop here. See, when you forward think, you forward think for others. When you forward think, you're not just thinking for yourself. See, when God sees your future, he doesn't just see you. He sees everybody you impact. He sees everybody around you. He sees the lives that you'll change. He sees the people that, that get better lives. He sees, he sees everything. This, tonight I was walking through the auditorium, coming from the, coming from the children's area into the auditorium. And uh, tonight one of my sons is, is playing drums in youth. And I think, wow, had I not forward thought. Had I not been thinking forward with God, where would that little boy be? Where, where would he be tonight? But instead, tonight, he's playing the drums in youth. Why? Because I said, listen, I'm going to forward think with you. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to stay here. 
I'm going to take you to one more verse. Let's go to Philippians. I read this verse a lot through the years. It gave me strength and helped me. But I didn't read the verse in front of it. We're going to go to Philippians. I'm sorry. We're going to go to Philippians one more time. Philippians chapter 3. See, kids would have laughed at that. They would have thought that was funny. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. We'll go to verse 13. It says, No, my dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting my past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race, and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. Paul said, listen, this one thing I do. One thing I do daily. Because there are people who remind me of what I was. I was a killer. I did lie about people and put them in prison and have them killed. That's what Paul said. But he said, I don't remember that. He said, this one thing I do. Forgetting. This one thing I do, forgetting. And once I forgot, then I press on to the future. Sometimes, guys, we let our past dictate our future. We stay right where we are because we're looking back. Or we're doing this, we're going forward and then we look back. And then we fall because we're looking back at our past. And then we stand up and go, see, didn't work. I knew I was going to fall again. Well, it's because you're looking back. Paul said, I forget what's behind me. I don't, even look at, I don't even look at it anymore. I press. The word press there, he didn't say, I just walk to the future. I just walk on. He didn't say, I run. He said, no, I press. What does that mean? That means he gets down behind his shield of faith and he pushes with all that he has. Even when people are saying, you were a liar, you were a killer. He's down behind that shield and he's pressing forward. He's moving ahead. He said, listen, I'm forward thinking. I am never going to allow my past to dictate my future. My past doesn't control me anymore. I may have done what they said I did, but I am not who they say I am. I am who God says I am. God is a forward thinker and Paul had to begin to think forward with God. And just think, he wrote two thirds of the New Testament because he became a forward thinker. Think of all the things he could have let hold him back. All the things he could have said, but I did it, but God, I did, but God, I... He said, no, this one thing I do, this one thing, if I don't do anything else, this one thing I do, I forget my past. I forget everything that they said about me. I forget everything they say I've done. I put up my shield of faith. I hold out my sword. I get down and I press forward because God is calling me to something greater than where I am right now. Guys, we can't allow our past to dictate our future. We have to be a forward thinker, if not for us, for everyone who's looking to us and for all that we're going to change. Here at Victory Church, when children's ministry say we're reaching into the future, changing lives. We're not just changing the lives of the kids that are in children's church, but we're changing the lives of every person they'll talk to. Every person, they'll lead to Jesus. We're changing the lives of every person, every seed that we plant in their life and they use to help others. Every person, we're forward. We're forward thinking. And one day, one day I'm going to walk out on the stage and there's going to be a stadium full of kids there. What will you say to them? I don't have any idea, but I know it'll be great because it'll be just what they need at that time. And once I walk out on that stage, God will have something else for me to do. I don't know, maybe I'll be training other people to have other stadiums. We'll see. Tonight, we need to be forward thinkers. Every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment, please. If you're in this room and maybe, maybe you're in the situation that I'd found myself in. Maybe you've been whining a little. And you haven't been forward thinking. Maybe everything's great, but you just haven't been forward thinking because everything just got comfortable where you were. Everything's great, so why think forward? I mean, just keep everything the way it is. 
But you realize tonight, if you stay where you are, their lives won't be changed. People won't be touched. Maybe you're just tired. I'm telling you, God says, if you're tired, I'm ready to build you again. I'm ready to take you and start building tonight. You don't have to stay where you are. Tonight, if you say, Pastor Nathan, I'm tired and I want to be a forward thinker. I'm not staying where I am anymore. Tonight, I choose to rise up and be a forward thinker. I'm not staying where I am anymore. Tonight, I'm going to begin to trust God. And just like he forward thinks, I'm going to find out what it is he wants me to do, and I'm going to forward think with him. Whatever it is, I'm pressing in. Like Paul said, I'm forgetting my past. I'm pressing on the future. If that's you tonight, if you would, do me a favor and just stand up and take a stand tonight and say, I'm ready. I'm ready to forward think tonight. Just stand up right where you are. I'm not staying where I am anymore. Tonight, I choose to start forward thinking. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Dear Father, God, I just pray for every person standing. Lord, it took a lot of guts for them to stand. You said if someone would stand for you, that you'd stand with them. So, Lord, I thank you that you're standing with us tonight. Lord, tonight we choose to be forward thinkers with you. Tonight, we choose to not stay where we are, but to go forward. From this place, we will rise. From this place, we will build something great. Because you're in it. We can't fail. Lord, I pray for everybody that's standing. God, I pray you give them a dream. Fill their heart with hope. And give them a dream, God. A dream that's so big, it can only come from you. Because they can't do it by themselves. Lord, I thank you. Tonight, we're going to be forward thinkers, no longer staying where we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would tonight, I'm going to have them lead us in one more song. If you would, let's stand up together and let's sing this together.